This is the news conference just before the opening of the 1981 Convention of National Farmers at Indianapolis. Devon Woodland meets the reporters for radio, TV, and the newspapers, and the correspondents for the magazines that cover the farm and ranch scene all across the United States. Woodland meets the press as agriculture faces an interest rate crisis and stagnating price levels on nearly all commodities. Devon Woodland, president of the NFO. On that, Don, will you? First, let me say that we're happy to be in uh, Indianapolis with our national convention. We, it's the first time that we have had the opportunity to be in your city, and we appreciate the press and their interest in our convention. And I want to uh, emphasize this point, that you will be witnessing the largest gathering of farmers in the country at this convention. We anticipate 4,000, and these will all be tillers of the soil, actual farmers and ranchers. Uh, there may be other groups uh, who would compare in numbers, but a large percentage of those will not be directly affiliated with the soil. Now, the convention theme for this year is going to be collective bargaining more than marketing. And to better understand that, I want to spend just a moment with you on it. Collective bargaining is a concept that is new in the agriculture circles. It is not new as far as the working people are concerned in the country. We embraced this principle in 1955, 1958. We become earnestly involved in seeing it fulfilled for agriculture. We believe that farmers and ranchers have the right, the responsibility, to determine value of the goods that they manufacture. Every industry in America has established that right. They pursue it, and it is a reality with them. Agriculture has not at this point. And they become victims of the marketplace wherein they take what is offered by those whom they deal directly with. And so it takes no talent to work in an existing market structure and move commodity into that system because it is there functioning for the interests of the buyers. Collective bargaining takes talent because you use your energies to improve the market uh, and the conditions that exist in that marketplace. The glowing need for agriculture today is stronger representation at the marketplace. And if, in fact, that becomes a reality, all other issues, all other concerns of agriculture can be dealt with adequately. But if there is not stronger representation in the marketplace, that need that agriculture has will be continued. And so the goals of this organization is to establish our right to determine value uh, of commodities at the marketplace being brought about through collective bargaining, negotiating contracts. And this organization is different than any other farm organization wherein we never take title, own or control, buy nor sell. We are the negotiating instrument between the two parties, the buyer and the seller, representing the seller because we are all farmers and ranchers and do farm, ranch, and sell farm commodities. So uh, this uh, outlines to you the goals and the purposes of the organization. We run a recent poll that covered 10 Midwest states among farmers who were members of our organization and those who were not. And of that group, 64% believed that collective bargaining was a must for agriculture to put economic stability into its business. 74% believed there was a need for the National Farmers Organization at the marketplace. And so the field is wide open. It's ours for the asking, really. But what we have to do is to help people understand what we are versus what they think we are because what they need, we have. Okay, I'm going to toss it open, and at this point, we'll visit with you. Well, I'm going to say to the panel, but can you hear me? Looking at the farm bill, there's been quite a bit of haggling over that in Congress right now, and the farm subsidies question being bantered back and forth in both houses. How does this idea of collective bargaining fit into what's going on in Congress? Thank you. For purposes of recording, I'll try to uh, restate the question. The Farm Bill and how it affects collective bargaining. All right, first of all, we uh, do not believe in the free market system that the President talks about. We believe it's non-existent in agriculture, that the market is under the domination of a few major companies and corporations. We do not believe that you'll ever legislate adequate farm income. Regardless of a Farm Bill, it's less than adequate. 
It originally was designed as a base or a floor under agriculture markets, but unfortunately it has become the ceiling and everything is operated from that point down. So we have very little faith in the legislative process to deal with the real issues of agriculture and that's the reason we have chosen the course of collective bargaining. The farm bill, the farm program may be a temporary assist, but I don't believe that we ought to be expected to negotiate farm income through a legislative political football atmosphere uh, and control farm families' standard of living. Uh, if it's such a good idea to pursue that, I think we ought to put autom automobiles before the legislature and let them debate their value. They ought to move other industries in, not just agriculture. Collective bargaining is separate and aside from the legislative process. Full farm income will only come through collective bargaining. As far as the amount of inflation we're seeing in the economy right now, obviously when a farmer becomes more lucrative in the marketplace, it's going to drive prices up of retail goods to the consumer. Do you see this being <coughs> a, a large jump all at once, or will this be a gradual kind of thing that the consumer can cope with? Uh, the ideal thing would be for it to be a gradual increase. Uh, it would be more palatable to people, but that need is there and it must come. Uh, right now, the uh, American people have received so much for so little for so long that it would be hard for them to uh, accept a dramatic immediate increase. But they do have the largest variety of food, the highest quality at the lowest price of any place in the world at the expense of farm debt. Can we turn that around a bit though? Um, will the farmer in getting his fair share, which we've heard farm groups, farm lobby groups talk about for some time, being a need in the farm community, are we going to see the bread lines of Poland in the United States as a result of this? No, I think not. Uh, I don't think that we have that concern. Uh, the American farmer is a professional. He has, uh, he's the envy of the world in his ability to provide food for this country and many of the underdeveloped countries of the world. And uh, he has some degree of responsibility. Uh, he is not going to become greedy and overbearing as he moves into controlling his industry. Uh, I think he would be much more fair than would the Exxons, the Mobiles, uh, U.S. Steel, uh, these major corporations. And if uh, economic stability is not uh, sought and gained by him for his industry, then he has no alternative because farm debt will not allow him to remain as a tiller of the soil and he'll become a hired man for someone who has the ability to price the commodities as they have done. And then America and the American people will be the losers. How is Reaganomics affecting the farmers? Well, uh, it's only been in effect six, eight weeks. I don't know that we can really say that it has or has not worked. We know that what we have done over the years, the past many years, regardless of the administration, I don't think it's a party-aligned condition. I think it's one that has developed over many, many years. Uh, so whether or not we can say it's worked, I think we're being unfair, but what we have done over the years has not worked, as we know, because conditions have continued to deteriorate and inflation would have been much worse had it not have been for agriculture's willingness, uh, with no control over that, to supply cheap food. And so uh, inflation has been uh, curbed to some degree by agriculture's uh, willingness to supply food. But the trickle down, the economic theory versus economic reality, I think we can talk about. And all of us understand that you cannot continue to sell goods below what they cost you and balance the checkbook. Uh, the theory of the trickle down, uh, I don't know. We have been on that type of a theory for several years where the farmer has taken the last trickle on the totem pole. And so the trickle down theory, uh, I don't think is good for America to where you have uh, a handful of the major corporations in the country who employ and determine the destiny of the masses of people by employing or having them employed by some of the major corporations. Uh, we believe that people have the right to ownership, that business, independent business, men have the right to own and develop their business. Uh, private enterprise versus free enterprise. Private means uh, every individual has the right to go into business. Free means to me that the large get larger and can at some point uh, take control of the total system. Mr. Boylan, 
when you were quoting some figures, some percentages, I think you said 70 plus percent of the farmers you surveyed were in favor of the NFO and the work they're doing for collective bargaining. Um, when you look at that kind of a situation, are they going to be willing to trade off subsidies for this, government subsidies for this kind of bargaining? I think once they understand how the principle can work, and all they have to do is look at those who have used the principle, whether it be the school teacher, the fireman, the ball player, we can look at our society and that principle has been used and has been successful in every phase of our society. And once those who produce the food and fiber in this country recognize that, then in fact uh, it can serve their needs and will fit into their programs and they can uh, uh, deal with uh, economics and agriculture much more clearly than they can depending on a open or a free market that's referred to which simply does not exist. But you're going to have some convincing to do with these people, right? No question. We have to have them understand what we are versus what they think we are. And that's the challenge that lies ahead. <clears throat> well, then, then you, you see then that uh, through collective bargaining becoming effective, you could get rid of uh, government subsidies if they now exist. I think that the end result is that farmers have the control over their destiny through negotiating contracts at the marketplace with the first handler. And until that becomes a reality, the farm programs, the farm bill, uh, will be an assist to them to that point. But the ideal situation is for farmers and ranchers to negotiate contracts at the marketplace that deal with their costs of production and then also allow them to present a profit. Yes. Ostensibly, the, the geographic base of farming, we see the middle part of the United States as being, yes, the major place where wheat and corn and hogs and beef are produced. But if you can get a better price for those commodities, which are not produced, say, in California, are we going to see the Indiana farmer negotiating his contracts with California buyers directly versus selling their beef in the marketplace in Chicago or something like that? I think at some point there will be less buying stations in the country and there will be direct negotiating with the major companies. Uh, and uh, that is a good sign. Uh, if we become a major source of supply uh, to any company, it makes sense that we deal directly with them. It will reduce the cost to them and to us both. So aren't we just pushing the burden up further toward the consumer instead of being um instead of making the farmer negotiate with the system, we're making the consumer then deal with the system because you're going to have larger buyers instead of more consolidated. I don't think system. there's any question but what the consumer is going to have to pay more for food that they buy. Uh, there's no question in my mind what that must come about. Uh, and it may wind up in the end that the consumer group is going to have to have some degree of organization to protect them from being exploited. But uh, we know who's being exploited now. And so perhaps it will take a joint effort by those two groups, the producer and the consumer, to work on what we believe is unfair profit margins somewhere between the two spectrums. Is the NFO the only farm group pushing for collective bargaining? Yes. How come no other farm groups do? They are not structured for it, first of all. Uh, one of the major farm organizations is structured by the state, and they begin to negotiate and compete against each other state by state. And that will never work in a collective bargaining process because your buyers are geographically covering the entire nation. They are national companies, and they now uh, can <laughs> glean their supplies from all areas of the United States, and they are not affected by any state movement. It has to be a national collective bargaining program to deal with those same buyers. Uh, others are concentrating more intently on legislation. That seems to be their thrust. Some are involved in farm service centers. These are all important, and we're not... Uh, uh, desiring to uh, negate their importance. But we believe that once the farmer has stronger representation at the marketplace, he can deal with all these other aspects. But until he does, all these other uh, problems that he uh, sees in agriculture will be there forever. Is the NFO plan some kind of campaign to get the, the idea of collective bargaining across the farm? We've been operating on that approach nearly you now uh, for 20 years. So we're not a new organization in it. We do have ourselves structured in most of the states to some degree, depending on the commodity and the state. Uh, we have our tentacles have gone out perhaps as completely as any farm organization has. 
uh, and uh, we just need to take and uh, establish a PR, an educational program, because we believe we have what they want and our survey suggests that we do. So in other words, one of these days somebody's going to walk into the stockyard here in Indianapolis and say 70% of us say we're not going to, to go with the market price. We want to negotiate a contract. I mean, how is it going to come about? Is it going to take lobbying? Or uh, you're oversimplifying. I wish that would happen that way. But uh, it will be a, a much more, a greater challenge than that. And it will have to be on an individual basis when that individual farmer becomes a member. And then he looks at the contracts we offer. He either accepts or rejects. And hopefully that contact, contract will be accepted. And when enough of them do accept, then we will initiate delivery based on that agreement that we have made with them. Going into a plant with a percent of his kill or percent of his supply and uh, when we have that, then we come out with a, uh, an agreement that uh, would be workable. And then we will move from one to the other until hopefully uh, that uh, end goal is realized. Mr. Woodman? Yes. Uh, through that, that collective bargaining, what, would that, what, would, uh, that, what effect would that have on the uh, grain market, border trade, futures market, and speculative market? Well, uh, I'm sure it would be a direct challenge to them. Uh, I'm not convinced in my mind that farm markets ought to be determined by those who trade and transfer paper among themselves. That that farm market ought to be determined by those who manufacture, those who own the commodity. And as that paper transaction takes place, uh, uh, I think it's an unfair way to determine the value. Uh, it's a direct threat to that, that system. Uh, your point's well taken. That is one of the big challenges. The independence of the farmer uh, that he has boasted of, he doesn't have anymore. There isn't very, but very few of them that can buy and sell anything without going through farm credit people. They have lost their independence, but they do not at this point realize that they have. They still believe that uh, uh, anytime you go to a, a farm credit system to borrow your money, and he dictates the policies under which you can borrow and spend, uh, the farmer is the least independent at this point of uh, any group of people we got because of the debt load that he's, uh, he's carrying. He's lost that independence. But uh, he still thinks that he has it, and he is somewhat uh, reluctant to uh, give up what he thinks he has. Now, we're not asking him to give it up because as he negotiates contracts, reviews the details of that contract that he uh, is offered, then he makes up his individual mind as to whether he wants to become a part of it or not. So really we're giving him independence rather than taking away from him because he doesn't have that ability or that choice to make today. But we want to give him that choice. Mr. Woodman? Yes. Do you uh, think the U.S. Department of Agriculture or other government agencies should be negotiating commodity prices with foreign governments or should that be foreign government? Well, I think they, uh, that becomes uh, part of the role of government to do for people what people cannot successfully do for themselves. And certainly dealing with foreign nations and foreign governments is something that I don't believe that uh, we have the ability to do. That is part of their role. But I think they ought to have a base that they work off from. Export markets, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, are not the salvation of agriculture. Uh, as we sometimes listen to uh, promote export markets, anytime you export a commodity at less than its cost, uh, it hasn't really uh, filled or serviced a need, and that's what we're doing. I think there ought to be a base under which they can negotiate from up uh, just to uh, negotiate uh, regardless of the market level, I think is uh, less than being business-wise. We need to establish a base price that will return to, return to that industry, agriculture. Its costs in manufacturing, anytime you export, all you do is export the industry if it's below the cost the industry has involved in it. And so export markets are not the salvation. All they are is a dumping market. They, uh, if, in fact, they would allow the domestic market to fluctuate up, 
because of an export sale, then there would be some merit in it. But uh, we know that uh, that has not been the case in the past, and uh, I question whether it will be in the future. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Do you uh, see a continuing decline in the number of uh, farms, particularly family farms? The uh, figures, if, uh, if we have followed the figures over the years as farm-oriented people, we know that in the 50s there was some 6 million. Today there is uh, roughly two and a half thereabouts, give or take, depending on what your definition of a farm family is. Uh, the latest figures that I received uh, was that there were 150,000 who migrated from agriculture in 1981. Now, it used to be that the farmer would say, as uh, he faced that decision, uh, I'll just sell out and I'll go to town and get a job. Well, I challenge any of them to go to town today and get a job. The jobs are not there. So the farmer and rancher is going to have to take a stand. He's going to have to stake a stand because his industry is at stake. And uh, we want to be that influence that gives him the ability to take that stand and give him that economic protection that he must have that's our challenge. Yeah, my, my question was, do you see the, the decline in, in, in number of family farms as being a threat to, to American agriculture and American people? Define a family farm for me, and then I can tell you. If it's a 40, 60, 80 acre, yes. Uh, if I'm it's. Sorry, it's state, state on the the but there, there's no question, but what, unless there is economic stability given to agriculture uh, in the near future, uh, there will be a continued transfer of ownership of land. And we don't think that that's healthy for the country. NFO President Devon Woodland's news conference just before the opening of the 1981 convention of the National Farmers Organization at Indianapolis. Phil Allen for NFO News. And that for today is something to think about. The ladies' meeting of the National Convention has been a drawing card for outstanding speakers. This year is no different. The present guest speaker is Pat Dubois, president, past president of the Independent Bankers Association and a long time holding of the Agricultural Committee of that association. And now here's Doris McElwain with that introduction. So Pat, would you like to take over the program please? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to have an opportunity to come here this evening and to visit with you, and that is what I hope to do, and as Doris has said, uh, I will be glad to try to respond to questions if uh, you have any after I've finished my remarks. Uh, but first of all, I want to say that when uh, Doris called me and uh, told, me that, told me that she would, that the NFO would like to have me attend their convention and speak to the convention, I thought to myself, uh, Gee, Pat, you've gone down that trail, uh, you know, you're getting some mileage on you. You ought to have taken the saddle off the horse before, and uh, I think you ought to say no. But uh, you people probably realize how persuasive Doris is. Before uh, I got through, I not only said that I would attend, but she also extended an invitation, which I was delighted, to my good friend, the present president of the Independent Bankers Association of America, who is here with us tonight and who you will hear tomorrow. Am I coming through back there now better? All right, thank you. When Doris introduced me, I'm glad that she didn't uh, introduce me as a consultant, because uh, a consultant is a person who knows 26 ways to make love, but doesn't know any girls. <laughs> Doris is right. Uh, I'm not a newcomer to the NFO. I remember NFO when Orrin Lee Staley was your president. I remember Butch Swain. I remember Red Paulson. I remember Ed Graff, who I understand is still with uh, NFO. I had uh, many good conversations with him. But I think of all of these people, I probably was uh, motivated more by Vince Roster, who was a great friend of NFO, and an anal analyst who, in his own way, provided information that I think was more usable even than Carl Wilkins, 
although Carl Wilkins set the stage for many of the things that Vince uh, later developed. Doris has said to you that uh, some of us uh, appeared in Washington in one stage of the game to try to find out what Washington really had in mind for agriculture. And at that time, Senator Humphrey uh, was uh, a prominent person in the Senate and had great persuasive powers. And so we went to see him, and we told him we'd like to see the uh, to meet with the Council of Economic Advisors to the president. And uh, Humphrey said, well, he said, that's no problem. He said, you ought to meet with those people. And so we said, well, OK, uh, wise guy, set it up for us. And within an hour, he set up a meeting for us the next day. And we met with two members of the Council of Economic Advisors. And before we got through, we got them to openly admit that they did not even pencil in, and I say pencil in, agricultural in the national planning for the economy or the budget. They took agriculture for granted. And this is a, was probably one of the most disturbing and also eye-opening experiences that I had at that time as we and the Independent Bankers Association attempted through its agricultural rural America to make the people of the country more aware of the farmer's problem and to make the bankers particularly more aware of the, of, the banker, of the farmer's problem. We did some work in those days that was controversial in trying to get the bankers to recognize that they had an equal stake in the welfare of rural America, in the price structure, and we were effective to a degree. It was interesting to watch NFO develop. It was interesting to watch its membership grow. And in Minnesota, I am proud to say that we have one of the stronger groups in the National Farm Organization. Those people in Minnesota realize full well the, the collective bargaining program, the theme, and they're moving to do what they can as you are nationally. One of the problems that the NFO has and its memberships ha has is they do not presently control a sufficient share of the market to be as effective as they need to be. You have made a worthwhile contribution and you will continue to, but it's difficult to expand your membership to the extent that's necessary in order to control a supply base that will help you set the price to where it adequately needs to be. Now, one of the reasons that this situation occurs is because, like myself, many of you are getting older. And as you get older, it's harder to continue the farm, the family farm in, your, in the next generation. And so therefore, you older persons must join forces together to see that the youngers, youngsters that are coming into farming to fill your shoes move on into a, a productive and cooperative role in the National Farm Organization. And if you do this, then you will be able to perpetuate your organization. One of the real problems we have is having older people drift out and no younger people moving in to take over and carry on the battle. So that is one of the things that is uh, necessarily before you. Another problem that I think that farmers have, and it isn't particularly uh, necessarily true just to farmers, I think it's true to many of us in the rural areas, I think it's true to those of us who are independent bankers in our rural communities, is that we have a pride of independence that somewhat makes us an entrepreneur or in the case of a farmer, maybe kind of a landholder or a land baron. And we think we ought to be able to do any of the things that we might like to with our land and that we would like to be independent to do it alone. You can't do it alone today. You've got to have organized efforts such as you, such as you are exhibiting here tonight. You've got to have cooperation and pulling together in order to accomplish your goals. Individually, you are without a voice. You are without strength and you can't accomplish the things that you need to do. I wanted to talk to you just briefly about what's happening uh, to farming, and it's happening to rural communities, it's happening to small businesses, it's happening all across the board. The inflation that has taken place in this country in the last several years has put the cost of production to the farmer far beyond the return that he gets in the marketplace for his production today. Petroleum fertilizer, chemicals, machinery, labor, interest, all of these things now are beyond the stretch of our imagination only a few years back. And this is a problem that we're not going to be over, able to overcome very easily. We may see some lower interest rates before too long, and I question how long they will last once they do come down. But I have a hard time seeing how we're going to have cheaper energy costs in the next 
several years or maybe from now on out. So I think that you're going to be in a high cost period of production which is going to require the best management that you people can develop. I want to just to mention some parity prices because I think it sets the stage quite well. These are parity prices that, I, that occurred, uh, were published in September of this year, and so they're not too far off. At that time, wheat, the percentage of parity on wheat was 50%. Well, when you're only getting 50% for growing wheat, it just stands to reason you're going to have a hard time having sufficient cash flow to pay your bills. Corn was 65%, barley 56%, soybeans 57%, milk 70%, the highest of all, beef cattle 63%, hogs 60 percent and lamb 60 percent. That's not sufficient today for farmers to be able to stay in business. It's an indication that unless we can improve our position in the marketplace that we won't be in farming too much longer. We talk about free markets and I think that there are those in the audience and there are many people across the nation that think that free markets are the only way to go but there are no free markets today. Energy is priced beyond your control. There's nothing free as far as that's concerned. This is manipulated and a controlled factor that sets the price, and you have to buy it. It's the same with fertilizer and chemicals.